And hello again, folks. I'm John Ray. We are here for another edition of Frazier and Dieter's Business Beat. And I'm alongside, of course, Roger Lesby. Roger. Well, good morning, John. Good morning. It's a crazy world, Ren. You know, the world's falling apart, but as they say, the show must go on. <laughs> the show must go yeah, That's right. The show must go on. And that includes the season, right? The, the season goes on. They, that, they haven't canceled that, have they? They have not, although they have had talks about uh, maybe extending that. So uh, right. we are hopeful that that could happen. We'll stand by. And you'll tell us, right? We will. Awesome. Um, so, folks, we've got a great guest today, John Hightower. He's with Arch and Tower, and we're going to let him tell you about Arch and Tower, and there's some big news to tell. Absolutely. John, thank you so much for having me, and Roger, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for welcoming us on the show. We're so excited to be a part of the uh, the Frazier and Dieter organization. Arch and Tower was founded two and a half years ago, and it has been an amazing opportunity to come alongside and partner and uh, be acquired by Frazier and Dieter to continue to serve their clients in a much more holistic manner. And it's just been a joy and a pleasure. And I'm so thankful to be talking about our firm and uh, more importantly, talking about uh, some really topical matters out in the business world today. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's... Uh uh, I guess I'm going to ask two questions of, of both of you. One is, uh, John, maybe you can talk about Arch and Tower, what you do, how you help clients. And Roger, maybe you can chime in after that about the attraction for Frazier and Dieter and why this, this uh, acquisition was made. That'd Absolutely. be great. Yeah, go ahead, John. So it's really interesting when you think of the business world right now, there's so many moving parts. And our firm had found some traction with working with companies and systems and solutions around three primary areas, the customer experience, the employee experience, and operational excellence. And we'll talk about that in greater detail in a few moments. But those are three things that when we worked along some of our anchor clients, Chick-fil-A, and then working with the founder of the Rich Carlton, Horst Schultz, he, People continually ask, what do they do well? They take care of their customers. They take care of their employees and they look for continuous improvement. And, uh, we said, man, that's a really cool model to think about. Uh, and I'd seen some things in research that I'll share a little bit in a moment. I said, man, that's a, a very unique consultative model to say, Hey, how do we create systems? And some of these are common sense things where you can really engage people in a very different way. So we, um, we, it's just been an amazing opportunity to build and work with some amazing clients from startups to uh, large organizations. It's a true blessing. Awesome. So Roger, what, what's the attraction of that kind of advisory business to Frazier and Dieter? Well, I think you just heard some of that. Uh, obviously John and his team are, are very young. They're very talented, but they offer for Frazier and Dieter an opportunity for us to get into what we'll call management information, data, consulting. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the accounting firms are looking at building that consulting base, that consulting wing. Uh, they work with a lot of high profile clients, uh, clients that are very similar to the types that we serve. Uh, they had clients not only here in Georgia, but uh, but across the country as well. And so I think that all of that was exciting for us. Uh, plus, they're just genuinely good people. And uh, I think that the talks were were very easy on both sides. We had John and his team come and present to the partners uh, before year end um, with what they do and some of the things that they do. And I think that was a great presentation. And it really, I think, uh, accelerated the uh, the need or the vision for us to put this together. And part of the way you that Frazier and Dieter describes itself right now is uh, a CPA and advisory firm. It's It's about the advice that you give throughout the year on how to run your business better beyond just taxes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, we've, we've used their, their team and, and their talents to even look at some of our own data and look at some of our own questions. But, uh, but maybe John can start with uh, maybe explaining how you guys came up with the name of uh, Arch and Tower. And then secondly, uh, maybe just some of the things that, that, that you do, especially with data because a lot of times, John, the clients don't know the questions to ask. Mm. And in ferreting through the data, uh, John and his team are actually helping the client devise the questions and then trying to find the solutions sure. for that. So I want to go back to one key moment, and it was talking about the opportunity to join uh, Fraser and Dieter. For us, the CPA that, that we have is a trusted advisor, and I was so excited about that. And for the business owners that are out there, 
uh, maybe it'd be a small or mid-sized business, that CPA can provide so much value and you, as you transition your company from one stage to another. Mm. And that's one thing that I, when we looked at the opportunity to join Frazier and Deer, just a highly respected firm in the field to help people really think through those business challenges and providing value alongside of them is really exciting. And now we get to do some really cool work together. And Roger, you talked about the brand name and we really labored on this. And I've had to be really honest, like when we came up with the brand, I was fatigued on going through the motions of what is our brand? What is our vision? What is our mission? And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I was getting really exhausted. And when I had an amazing partner, Ryan, who's on our team, um, he said, give me the weekend. I think I, we can really punch through and come up with a great name. So I remember I was in Orlando and I remember looking on my phone and we're, we're a remote, we, we, we are built for remote work. And I remember the name coming across my phone and it's Arch and Tower. And I was like, okay, let me understand the brand story. And arches span gaps and carry weight. Sure. We want to do that with our clients. We like to de-silo organizations and arches do that. And then towers lift people up for a strategic vantage point. So that's what we do with our clients. We help bridge gaps, carry weight for them. We really uh, come alongside and work with our clients in that second mile service where we go that extra mile. We say, hey, how can we best serve? Really bridging that gap for them interdepartmentally. How is marketing and technology working together? How's operations and sales working together? There's a lot of opportunities to be more effective and efficient in those blind spots or in those silos. So we come alongside and work with organizations there. And then strategically raising people up on a tower, you get that advantage to look over the field and that comp, uh, competitive field and looking to say, Hey, how can we go about business maybe differently or tweak our business model and say, Hey, is there a market opportunity we're unaware of? It could be data. It could be, Hey, how do we look at our customer and employee data to understand is the customer satisfaction a lagging indicator compared to your employee experience? If your employees are dissatisfied, the long tail is going to be your customers are dissatisfied, but so often, and rightfully so, we focus on the customer. We would challenge folks to think, who's my customer? That may be an internal customer. So we look at data. We understand, hey, what are those measures that we can look at to really start to de-silo conversations? And then from there, develop some solutions that are proven, some methodologies that we've seen in the market, as well as things that we work with our clients to create uh, very much custom solutions to move the needle for them, need it be in the employer customer experience or looking for efficiencies to make things uh, a bit tighter. One last thing on the Arch and Tower name, half of our team went to the University of Georgia <laughs> with the Georgia Arch. Yes. The other half went to Georgia Tech with the Tech Tower. Um, oh boy. It's very collegial, uh -huh. uh, which means we're going to work hard. We're going to challenge. We're going to be innovative. We're going to come up with new thoughts. So when we onboard people, we talk about that. Like, continually look, continually be curious about how we can solve problems for people. Take that mindset of exploration into the field to work with your clients. I, I'm getting really excited here. I'm coming up out of my seat. I'm so excited. No, to talk this is great. This, so yeah, I was wondering you. if John was going to ever get to that <laughs> I know, definition. Right I know. This is, <laughs> this, it's it's this the is double awesome. click in. You're getting the secret sauce here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, appreciate this is, the time. Th no, this is awesome. Um, you know, you talked about, I guess, the maybe the chicken and the egg, right? The customer experience versus the um, employee experience, which comes first. And you throw operational uh, excellence in there and the, the operational experience for both constituencies. Mm -hmm. It's got to be different for different companies, right? Sure. I mean, it, t talk a little bit about that. It, it is. And rather than funneling people to a solution, this is our solution. This is our bread and butter. We're much more of a let's fan out and understand what's the best framework for your situation. Really becoming a data-driven organization is where we see firms um, taking an opportunity they haven't done before to say, hey, let's be very methodical about our approach to that customer experience and to the employee experience, working with their teams. And a lot of times it's working with the frontline employees to understand what are you seeing? So many times the executive committee will sit in a room and not necessarily understand what's really going on at that frontline level. We focus on what we call felt needs. So many times people will tell you something, but it's the question behind the question. They're saying something that's not coming out of their mouth. They're communicating something to you through their question that we need to really listen and, and focus on that empathetic listening to understand what that felt need is. So we would actually say, if you're to take an organizational structure, everyone has a customer. My customer may be my mid-manager. So if I can serve that mid-manager by removing hurdles for them for their daily task, him or her, whatever she's facing, um, how do we remove that obstacle for her? That's my number one customer. Even though it's internal, my number one customer is the people that 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 I get to support in my day to day work. So if you're a mid manager, who's that frontline person that you? That's your customer. How are you serving them? 
It's a paradox shift. It's flipping the org chart upside down. But when you start thinking about that, everyone has a number one customer. It just may be an internal employee. Right. And if you think about it, even in the CPA world, uh, for our staff, their, their, their immediate is, is their supervisor or their manager. It's not the external client. So they have an internal client, and that should be their focus, and hopefully is. And that's a mindset change. It is. Uh, I mean, as you say, I mean, it's, it's a big mindset change. How do you bring folks over that, uh, over that fence, as it were, in terms of getting them to rethink how they look at their supervisor or look at their uh, uh, fellow employees? It, it is one of those things that does take time. It's not most organizations, are they willing to make that type of, of shift and that change to think, hey, we need to think differently about our business. I believe that in our current situation, right? With coronavirus out, right. this will charge people to think differently about their business, how they do their business model. What are they doing to activate their employees? Um, how, what are they doing to reach out to their customers? I believe the, when there's change, there's opportunity and there's a massive change here. Um, organizationally, you coming into this, this time, this very challenging time that we're, that we will go through, we will succeed. America will be strong. The business community will take this opportunity to prove itself leading into it, we had the war for talent. Everyone, everyone was looking for the best talent. Sure. So there's continual changes that you know, for us, we are uh, a group that uh, we, we have great bit of experience. Uh, we may look a little younger than some of the others, but we are seasoned in our holistic approaches to things. That's what I love about our team. Very, uh, very unique skill sets coming to the table to solve some really challenging problems. To your point though, to change that organization, it takes strong leadership and people to say, we need to change the models that what got us here won't get us there. And as you go from that zero to one, from that idea and concept to a small business, from that small business to mid-sized business, you'll need to change how you're serving each one of those layers of employees over time. Um, love to connect with folks later. I'll share some information on how to, to get in touch with us and share with you a couple of articles that may be helpful to understand that, that mindset shift. Yeah, that's a great point because your company evolves and changes. You grow in a lot of different ways in terms of the customers that you serve, that changes the internal dynamics in ways that you have to adjust to as well. Sure. I mean, think about it. When you start a business, how do you make a decision? If you're a one person company, it's just like, you may, you may ask your spouse an idea or two, but you're off to the races. Then you get three or four folks and maybe five, 10, you may, you may even 20, 25, you start making decision by committee. And then you may move. Some organizations stay stuck in that paradigm of, of decision by committee. And then at some point you need to galvanize around a C-suite or a team, an executive team that has the trust of the organization. That's an important part. You got to have trust because when employees trust the, the, the leadership of the organization, things start to align. And that's what we see majority of the, op, uh, majority of the challenges are, is there trust in the organization? Is there a vulnerability from leadership? Is there authenticity? From there you get people's hearts. And when you get their hearts, you get their, their, their hands and their heads follow. Folks, if you just if you just joined us, we're speaking with John Hightower. He's with Arch and Tower, and uh, the, 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 a company newly merged with Fraser and Dieter. Um, John, we, you mentioned coronavirus. We can't let the show go go by without talking about the current situation and how maybe any tips you have for companies handling this current uh, crisis uh, with their employees with their um, customers and even the operational challenges that that creates. This is such a topic that I want to all the, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the people that are serving our community, uh, healthcare professionals. My mother is actually a nurse at fit Piedmont down on the uh, South side of town. And I'm just so thankful for the people putting their lives out there. So thank you for that. I do think we're an amazing opportunity to, to as leaders and businesses to, um, really stretch ourselves and really push ourselves. Uh, just a couple of things that we're working on and this is new territory for everyone. Generationally, it doesn't matter. I don't believe anyone has been through anything like this, even remember back to September 11th. Like these are just different circumstances when you're looking at the economy. Um, well, if anybody listen. out there was live in 1918 for the full, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> then, then they went through it. And but if, other than that, you know, we're, we're all rookies, right? If they're still working. Good for them. I would right. love to have that, uh, that, that uh, tenacity. Yeah. I th the number one thing is empathetic listening. Sometimes people just need to be heard. And just processing. And so many times I know for me, even in our business, 
just seeing how our employees are doing and talking with our coworkers, Roger, I mean, just seeing how they're doing, how are you doing? How, how are you physically, how are you physically, how are you mentally, how are you emotionally? They may, there may be some irrational things come out and that's okay because we're all human and we're processing this stuff. I'd really encourage leaders take some time and empathetically listen to your employees. The emotional stress, mental health is a hot topic moving into this entire space of employee experiences. This is just going to ramp up the need for leaders to really listen and just be part of, Hey, I, I feel you. This is a challenge. We're going to work through it. Constant communication would be point two. Even if there's fragmented information, if there's no information and people don't hear from leadership, they will manifest what it, some story in their head. And that is, that is proven. It's psychology tested. That will happen. Right. We just as leaders need to be aware of that. And we may not know what the solution is. I know for us, I'm not sure of our solutions, how are we going to work through this, but I can be authentic with my team and say, this is where we are. We did our briefing yesterday morning and I shared with them the most up-to-date information I had from our clients, from our leadership at Frazier and Dieter, and just assured them, Hey, we're going to work through this together. Then from there, sometimes it's creating focus for the team. Hey, for the next day, for the next two days, this is what we're doing. We're going to work on this, this project or move the needle here. We've been in constant communication with some of our key clients. We have daily updates every morning to see how things are going. I, this morning I had a key uh, a key data point with one of our, our customers this morning had a very great conversation, very authentic, and it helps so much to have that authenticity, right? So point one, empathetic listening. Point two, consistent communication. Three, as a leader, be authentic. People will sniff out if you're, you know, people are very wise. People will, will discern if you're, if you're shoveling something that isn't accurate, right? Right. And then four, this is an interesting one. This goes to the operational side, generational impact. This is a time where I believe organizations can tap in. And you hear Dr. Bricks yesterday in the in the press conference from the White House talking about the millennials are going to help get us through this by being wise about where they go out, being wise about how they use social media to get the message out. This is an opportunity for business leaders to say, hey, our next generation may have some really cool ideas on how to best help us get through this. They're technology savvy employees. And I know I'm broad forecasting on a, on a people group. But think about some really cool things. We leverage technology tools such as Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom. That that user group, that that employee base is close to some really cool, innovative things. And I just encourage folks, use this opportunity to get very innovative. Roger, you and I were talking about this before we came in here about, hey, there's some changes that need to happen. And like some of, some of the physical nature of work, we've got to be very thoughtful about how we adjust. And I'm not saying go on some strategic ramp, uh, like – uh, uh, strategic project right day, right now today, but just be thoughtful about that as we go through this change right now, especially day two, day three of this uh, coronavirus, we're still kind of putting our heads around things, but over time, I think this is a really cool opportunity to examine your business models. Part of you've mentioned authenticity. Part of being authentic is, is saying, I don't know, right? Because uh, none of us know the full implications of this including our leaders that are right there on the uh, have at the pulse of it all um so uh part of being authentic is just saying i don't know right absolutely sometimes the best question the best answer is i'm not sure let me get yeah. back to you and that is that is great now i would i would encourage you if a leader makes that statement be sure to come back and say hey i've researched it we're still unaware of what the situation is but i want to acknowledge and i want to make sure you felt heard so that you, what I call closed loop communication, mm. right? When pe we don't right. close the loop, people manifest a story and I mean, we all do it. I know I've done it. And it's one of those things we do in our personal lives. Oh, what did my wife say or my spouse say to me? And you know, how do I close that loop? How do I think about what I said to a friend and how do I close loop communication? Some of these principles, uh, you know, resonate outside the business world as well. And how does, how do you recommend communication with clients. You talked about employees sure. to talk about client communication. So this is, a, I think, a really cool time to be innovative. Uh, my, I have two girls, four and five-year-old daughters, and I came home uh, last night and they talked to me about how the Cincinnati Zoo was doing a webcast about uh, hippos, right? So for us, if we ever go up to Cincinnati, I've got brand awareness of the Cincinnati Zoo because they were doing something different to stand out. So if you traditionally 
maybe not have that, that touch point of a phone call to a client. Let's say you send them something electronically or you're having a, a traditional face-to-face meeting. This is an opportunity to extend that conversation. And if you're going to think you're going to send an email to a phone call, if you're going to have that phone call, maybe walk them through a zoom conference, do the best you can to stand out in this time. Cause over time that brand loyalty will come back couple of entry statistics, and maybe I should have led with this earlier. Cust- the customer experience is a $75 billion issue per year. That's numbers from PwC. $75 billion is wrapped up in this customer experience. Majority of the population, 82% of people feel like human interaction has a huge impact to the customer experience. So if you follow that math, really big customer experience opportunity cash flow wise majority of it comes down to that human interaction with with your team members your employees how do you enhance that employee experience and reach out to the customers and really uh not be part of that 75 billion dollar issue in the customer experience game so 75 billion is the amount uh, of foregone profit or sales i mean to, to define that 75 billion for for everyone yep so to, to uncover that statistic a little bit more, um, Pricewaterhouse came out with a study and said most companies have about 16% profit margin on the table when it comes down to the customer experience. So if you think about it, when you go to a when you go to an organization, there's probably a digital experience. Let's take um, let's take Chick Fil A for example. They have their Chick Fil A one out, which you can order food, right? That's a digital experience. You then go inside to pick it up, and right now you can still go inside to pick it up, or you can go through the drive through and pick up the food. You get a great human experience, right? And then let's change the narrative a bit and say you're ordering something online. Someone come and f- comes and physically delivers something to your home. You may have vendors that are part of your service model. And you may have to think about what that vendor experience is for your customers. And then lastly, maybe it's a support, uh, a support team. So a physical example is my family ordered a whiteboard for our home, for our, our, our classroom at home. And we ordered it from an, a, a very uh, well-known retailer and the people that came in and delivered the whiteboard dropped it on our hardwood floor and scratched the hardwood floor and, we got stuck in the insurance claim and it was a terrible experience, but those vendors were part of that bigger brand. And how do you ensure that that vendor experience, that customer experience flows all the way down to the person that's paying the bills? We probably would not be ordering from that large box retailer anymore because of that experience. Mm. Another example, when I touch about that on the support side is when people are calling to maybe have a conversation about an invoice, have a conversation about AR or AP, what is that experience like? What is your team uh, how are you training your employees to make that experience as best as possible? Finances are a very difficult topic to talk about, but how are you training those employees? So when you canvas your entire customer experience, and again, the four areas, one is digital, two is the human interaction, three is what we call the vendor experience, and four, which is the support systems of the product or service being delivered, how is that unified? We work with companies. We basically whiteboard everything end to end, starting at day zero or when they purchase the product, leading before, how do they hear about your product to what's the full service delivery? When Roger said, what are some of those things that Frazier and Dieter is engaging our team with? It's really mapping all of that out to say, how do we improve our customer and employee experiences? And really being holistic in that approach, you get to see some opportunities to increase uh, your customer experience and your employee experience. I know I went on a long conversation there, but I wanted to give you some depth. No, that's awesome. Uh, John Hightower is with us, folks. He's with Archon Tower, which is a a, a newly uh, uh, added to the to the family Fraser and Dieter family, a new a newly added uh, company to the Fraser and Dieter family. Um, I'm we've got a you mentioned uh, Horst Schultz, Schultze. I'll get it out um, and a, a relationship there, and and, and it's inspiration. It fr- is from from a well known customer experience guru, really. It's been an honor uh, to partner with him for the past three or four years and get to know him. And uh, as he heard about what we were doing and we saw some gaps in the market, um, we've got to to come alongside him and do some really cool things. And just being around the gentleman who started the Ritz Carlton uh, and really built that empire has been has been an amazing opportunity and inspiration to learn and understand some of the systems he put in place, augmenting that with some of our experiences um, need to be at some of the, the career stops we had had earlier in our careers really helped us solidify where we are in the market. And we found a gap and created some content. You can find it on needtolead.com. 
And it's a masterclass series that you can purchase individually or for your team that brings you through his um, service standards and how he created the uh, the Ritz Carlton Empire in two to three minute segments. So it was cool to, to partner with him on that. We've continued to work alongside him with uh, different clients and um, he does a great job of inspiring that C-suite and then how to, how can you execute some of those time tested standards at scale? So it's been a great honor to partner with him. Um, I've got to visit his hometown in Germany with him together. It's just been an amazing, um, amazing icon to work with. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, you know, I have to ask, is there anything particular that you, because things change over time and he's, he, he was involved from the Ritz Carlton from a very early point of point, but companies change, times change, communication styles change. So what are some tips that he would offer today that you've absorbed and, and you think are particularly noteworthy? Well, I'm, I'm not going to speak on his behalf. Okay, uh, that's I cool. Be, I want to use my words wisely yeah. here. However, what I would say is there's some timeless principles that always kind of transcend time. Um, and some of the things that we've taken away from some of the companies we've worked with, and I've mentioned a few of them, um, is continuing to listen to your customer and focus on the felt needs. Uh, we utilize a framework called design thinking from uh, Stanford's design school. And what it focuses on is empathetic listening at the front of your innovation process. And when you do that, you truly understand what are the true needs of my customers? What are the true needs of my employees? And then from there, you can prototype and create some solutions that may or may not work. And you may throw out three or four of them. We're, we, we've got a, um, uh, a very agile mentality of let's figure out, is this process need to be improved? Does it need to be challenged? Does it need to be changed? Let's make some adjustments. Let's tweak, let's test, let's look at data. And then we continue to refine. So that would be number one is consistently listen to your customers, consistently listen to your employees, um, pulse surveys, like just thinking more on the, the data side. Hey, how are you pulsing information? How are you pulling information? For me, another point. So one empathetic listening to customers and clients to look for siloed, situations in your organization and de-silo them. What that looks like is get a cross-functional team together. We worked with an organization that is um, does uh, some really interesting things in the concrete uh, field in aggregate rock and in uh, a Midwestern state. And we pulled together eight different departments to talk about their employee experience. And when we started to unpack that, it was crazy, Roger. You started seeing marketing saying, man, I didn't know we had an impact on employees. We had the front office staff saying, wow, this is how we engage with the customers. And when you start de-siloing that, you see opportunities for improvement. And one of the things that Horace would say is um, don't cut cost for cutting cost sake. Look for mistakes you're making and improve those mistakes. And I heard that. I, I've been with them for 30 years. 32 talks now. And I'd heard that quote for the first time last week. Uh, and I was like, man, that's a really interesting one. How are we removing the mistakes to remove cost from our systems? Um, so again, number one, listen to your customers and employees felt needs really focus on that. Number two, de-silo the situation, really look at other opportunities for improve. And then I, I think third, I think, I believe one of the, the most important parts is really have that vision and mission of your firm embedded in as many places as possible. So many times the vision and the mission stays on a wall and never makes it to the halls. Right. So how do you integrate that into you know your departmental objectives? They should align around your goals. Your uh, KPIs or what you're measuring need to align around, hey, how are we improving? How are we doing these things? We want to be an amazing service firm around X, Y, or Z. How are you pulling that back into your day-to-day? So- Focus on your customers and employees' felt needs to de-silo things as rapidly as and as effectively as possible. And three, integrate your mission and vision throughout your systems and your and your business. But I think it's safe to say that exceptional service and that customer experience that'll never go out of style. One hundred percent. If you take care of your customers, they'll take care of you. Folks, we're speaking with John Hightower. He's with Arch and Tower. John, I, I. Uh, can't let you go without giving you the opportunity to, to uh, talk about a success story or two, somebody that you've worked with that you're particularly proud of the results that came out of that engagement. Oh man, it has been amazing to work with some incredible clients. Uh, the, the Midwest company we're working with now, we're 
working with from their C-suite through their leadership team all the way to their frontline employees. And they have a thousand front uh, employees overall across 60 plants in, in the Midwest. And they're, they're transforming, and this company is 118 years old, and they're transforming from, um, let's just say, uh, a firm that was not focused on serving their employees and serving their team to now really becoming a customer-focused organization, what we call a CFO, customer-focused organization. And they're really going all in on how do we take that your number one customer may be the employee right next to you. They're really taking that to heart and really aligned. And you're, we are seeing movement. We're seeing cleaner communication. We're seeing uh, across team members. We're seeing, hey, the IT team for their organization is reaching out to the to the plants and saying, how can we serve you better? Which, if you think about it, it's a servant leadership mentality. But when the plants get higher bandwidth or they're getting the technology tool that they need, it accelerates business. Um, so that's just an amazing firm that's gone all in and said, let's let's really change the model. And they are in an industry that's ripe for innovation. Um, another one, it was a high-tech firm out of Boulder, Colorado, and it was a pleasure to work with them. They have an incredible amount of data and they commissioned us to work with their data sets to make it meaningful for the end user. So really listening and saying, what do your end users need and how do we design a solution and take all this data and uh, simplify it, which doesn't mean elementary. It means very high design, but very intelligent and getting the information to the customer at the right time with the right lens on it. That one's a really cool one because that's more of high tech. Sure. Um, and then what I'm incredibly passionate about, especially in this time, was a, um, a project we did in South Florida. And the business model for this firm is they're in the healthcare space. And they have figured out a model that serves the least of these, a lot of Medicare, Medicaid patients. And what they've done is they've transformed the model of bringing these patients in on a monthly basis to ensure that they, they do not become acute. And if they do become acute, how do we get ahead of that? So what that's doing is it's pulling load out of the traditional healthcare system and it's keeping people healthier longer that may not have access to healthcare that other people do. They challenge us with saying, Hey, we're growing. We're going from 50 locations across the Eastern seaboard to 200. Oh, wow. We need to do this quickly mm -hmm. and we need to scale some of our cultural components. So we rolled up our sleeves. We got to know the physicians, the case coordinators, the, um, the, the, the people on the floor and we built this digital solution, which they now can scale their cultural components across the entire, uh, footprint. So over a billion dollar company, it's continuing to scale. Um, and I love the heart of what they're doing. So it's been amazing to work with companies across the U S and, uh, specifically in Atlanta, um, working with some of the brands I've talked about before. It's been great to spend time and joining forces with Fraser and Dieter. It's just truly an honor and, Again, I'm so thankful, Roger, for you and the conversations we've had and look forward to continuing our relationship. And John, I'm so excited to be a part today. I'm just so yeah. thankful for our time. Absolutely. Uh, before we let you go, though, let, let's make sure folks know about the kinds of companies that you work with. You mentioned some specific names, but sure. I, I want you to to talk a little bit about some of the uh, folks that are that look at their current situation and, and um, uh, things they need to look for to think you might be a great fit for them. So the business models that we, or the, the, the businesses we've worked with, we have worked with startups that are, Hey, let's get out of the gate. Let's get going. Let's think about some cool things. I love working with them because they tend to be much more innovative mm -hmm. in nature. And you can try some really cool things with data and surveying and do some, uh, kind of stretch outside the box. We then can take some of those solutions into more of the traditional larger organizations. Um, that mid market, that, uh, that company that has maybe found that product market fit, they're starting to get revenues. Maybe they're in that 25 to $50 million range where they've been, they've been building, but they're saying, man, how do we break through and go to that next level? That's our sweet spot. Um, you know, mention those firms that they're in that billion dollar mark. Those are great because they've have the opportunity to really think about de-siloing, uh, positions we work with, we talked about the CX, the customer experience, employee experience, and our operational excellence, our model there. On the CX side, we traditionally work with the CMOs of organizations, chief marketing officers, and the employee experience. If you have a VP of HR, um, organizational development, maybe a chief people officer where they're saying, man, what's retention look like for organization? How do we keep people engaged? That's where we work there. And then on the operational excellence piece, we've done quite a bit of work inside a supply chain. In fact, we're developing some supply chain solutions alongside some of our tax and audit people at Fraser and Dieter working to, to uh, solidify and shore up 
supply chains? How do we make those more efficient across the business? We've uh, done some work in that space and really thinking about the COOs and how we serve them. So if you think about the model, you got the customer experience with the marketing officer, the chief people officer with the employee experience and the COO with the operational excellence. And if you think, if you think higher, the CEO, there's a CEO in that acronym. You can see it on our website. If you're a the CEO, you should be thinking about each one of those streams and how you're being more effective and efficient in each one of those. Great stuff. Roger, I could go on for a while. This is awesome. Good. John, why don't you tell the folks uh, who are listening uh, how to get in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, you can follow us on our website, artsandtower.com. There's actually some content there if you'd like to take a look at it. We've got a couple of really interesting um, pieces of content I'd like to point you to. We have something called Maslow's Hierarchy and Needs. And this goes back to what was studied in the 1940s and then picked up um, later on in the century and talked about where people fit in regards to their mental state and, and uh, their hierarchy of needs. And right now, most folks are probably in survival, thinking about where we are organizationally and as people. And then we take a lens and say, what does it mean for your business? What's it mean for your um, organization in regards to, are you always working on the urgent and not necessarily important? So it's an interesting article you can find. And then we also have a 14 point checklist on building excellence. It's a good tool to utilize internally to think about, Hey, where are we on a scale of one to five? And again, this is just some content that I'd highly encourage folks to look at. You can follow us on LinkedIn at archandtower.com. And then, um, if you'd like to learn more, you can always email me and you can email me at john, J-O-H-N at archandtower.com, A-R-C-H-A-N-D-T-O-W-E-R.com. This has been great. John Hightower, uh, CEO with Arch and Tower, a, a, a new company in, in the Fraser and Dieter uh, family. Welcome and welcome again. And thanks for being here. Thank you so much, John. It's truly a pleasure. Yeah, it's great to have had you here. Uh, folks, just a reminder that Business Speed is presented by the Alpharetta Office of Fraser and Dieter, and Fraser and Dieter is an award-winning international CP, CPA and advisory firm, and you heard heard a lot about the depth of that advisory here today. Uh, they've got te- deep technical expertise and an even deeper dedication to their clients. Their CPAs and advisors believe in investing in relationships to make a difference. For more information, go to FraserDieter.com. Roger, this has been fascinating. Well, it has. Thank you so much for hosting us, John. Yeah. I think you can hear the passion in John's voice, and I'm, he's excited, and we're excited to have them on board. It's, it's, this is awesome. Well, uh, we, we look forward to hearing more success stories uh, out of this uh, uh, new arrangement, new marriage. Awesome. Okay. See and you. See you next month. See you. See you in April. For, so uh, once again, folks, uh, for Roger Lesby, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on Frazier and Dieter's Business Beat.